Deputies, Mr. Jim Staley. Thank you. Yes, uh, I'll, it's, uh, I know this day bothers people, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what it means as we uh, progress through it. And actually, the, the visuals are not just all uh, fighting or that sort of related. I have quite a few that deal with the, uh, uh, the, the times, really. Uh, the 50s and the people in the area and, and that sort of thing. The other thing I should ask you, can you hear me okay when I'm talking like this? Because I'm extremely hard of hearing, so if you have a yeah. question uh, and I don't respond, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm about ignoring you. <laughs> okay, this is uh, an LST. Now, when I went through electronic school at Treasure Island, and when I graduated, I got my orders there, and I was assigned to USS LST 561. Well, I had never even heard of LSTs at that time. And I asked the instructor, I said, what's an LST? And he said, well, it stands for landing ship tank. But usually people refer to it as a large, slow target. So anyway, so that's, I was on the large, slow target for uh, 33 months. And uh, the ship is about, is uh, uh, 320 and 30 feet uh, like from here to here, 328 feet, which is just like a football field. And the beam is 50 feet. Uh, and of course, all the superstructures back here in the back and in the valve, there's some guns and things here. So uh, the flat deck area there is good for loading uh, car cargo and tanks and all sorts of other uh, other things on it, and so uh, and it also served very functionally as a helicopter landing pad. This is the stern view of it. There's a stern anchor here, which was dropped as the ship proceeded into the beach. The idea was to come in, they would drop that off several hundred yards offshore, and then the bow doors would open up. And or the battle doors would be open, and then it would hit the beach, and the ramp would come down, and the tanks and the cargo and everything would would, would be discharged there. So uh, this is kind of a diagram. I don't know how hard it is. Part the lowest uh, uh, deck was the hold. Most of all of these are just tanks for fuel and water and, and that things of that sort. The deck above it is known as was the. Uh, is this deck deck, and all the compartments along here pretty much were for stores or storerooms. There were some shops right in here, and there was only one large uh, uh, was a compartment back here which had uh, where some of our, the stores were kept right in here. There were uh, a, a freezer units in there which would hold 21 tons of, of, of meat and that sort of thing. And also, there was enough dry storage on this side over here to hold enough uh, dry food and stuff that would last for three months for this crew. There's about 120 uh, crewmen on there with about uh, you know 15 officers of that nature. And this center section, of course, is just it was known as the tank deck. It was open, and actually, this was two decks high. And this, this was where the tanks were killed. And then there was a ramp here, and the doors were here. And so when it was in on the beach, and you'll see in the picture of this as we go along, and they would, they would go out here. The top deck, this main deck up here, which we saw in the other pictures, any tanks or trucks or things were up here would come up here and go down a ramp, and then also go out those, those doors. Uh, the, in the, in the back quarters back there is where the crew uh, were whenever I went on board. This was my bunk right here. And all of these cans you see hanging from the chains here were simply ashtrays or butt kits and, and, and like this. And as we were saying, I don't know how people that didn't smoke survived during in those, those days because it, it was fine. You could smoke in there and leave your bunk until the smoking lamp was out at 10 o'clock at night or something like that. Well, here's a picture of us underway. And uh, due to the construction of it, it was a really, uh, it was a terribly rough uh, ship to ride on. When I 
I went on board the ship at uh, the Oakland Supply Center, and as we cruised out across San Francisco Bay and past Treasure Island, I was up on the bow of this sort of thing. It was the first time I had ever been on a ship in my life, and I thought I was born to be a sailor. Well, we got off the shore and got out here, and that thing started rolling around, and I decided maybe that's not the profession that I really wanted because it was just, that's about the only time I really ever up chucked it of all the time that I, I was on board with this. But the ship would come up and it would start to come down in the way. Now see, it's not very rough out there right now, but it would come up and come up over a trough and then when it come down and it would hit and you would see this. Now, due to this open area in the center of the tank deck, it was very flexible. Standing back up there, you could see the ship actually flex as much as a foot. It would actually bend that much when it would hit, hit that. A destroyer or any other conventional type of a ship would knife through the water. But this with this flat bottom, just this, just a cannonball every time. Well, we left over there, and nine days later, we went around uh, the southern part of Oahu, and uh, uh, there was, uh, in 1950 or 51, for me especially, the world was a far bigger place than it is today. And my uh, ideas of Hawaii and everything like that, there was a radio show back at that time that was transmitted from the uh, uh, Royal Hawaiian with uh, Royal Owens and or, or Harry Owens and the Royal Hawaiians, and Hilo Hattie, and, and that sort of thing. So I had to see that. So Monkey Key Beach was about the first place I hit. But as we steamed on down here, the channel coming into Pearl Harbor is right in here. And uh, this is what, uh, this is the USS Arizona. Now today, if you've been to Hawaii, which probably everyone has, the large memorial that's, that's built on top of that. Now, when, when, when this picture was taken just about two weeks before the 10th anniversary of the attack that put, put it on the bottom, because this is uh, November 1951, and of course December of, of, of uh, uh, 41 is whenever the attack came. So uh, that was put on about 10 years later. And uh, well, of that, I, as, as you know, there was over a thousand uh, sailors were killed, and uh, they left the bodies uh, on the ship and those all of them. So after there about a week, uh, we were there for about a week and uh, headed for Japan. Well, this is the ship's log from November the 26th, 1951. And the wind at uh, uh, four o'clock in the morning on the 26th was 30, uh, 30 knots. At five, it had picked up to 50. At six, it was up to 57. And at six, it was up to 60 knots, which is like a, uh, over 70 miles an hour that the wind was blowing. And, and this is the, the direction of which the wind was blowing from. This was the course in which the ship was, was headed. Well, we were going 269, which is almost due west. 270 would be due west. And then we had to change, they went 245, 245. They had to move further south because the ship was just rolling so bad that, uh, and I swear, I mean, I was in that bunk and I thought, you know, this is it. I, that ship would roll over and I thought, this is it this time. I had my escape route planned uh, uh, like this, but I, I like, but anyway, that kind of gives you an idea of what it was like in there. And, and there were 17 days of this. Uh, and I thought, you know, I can't take it. For three years, there's no way I can survive three years of this. Well, it wasn't quite that bad because we weren't underway all the time. But anyway, but anyway, seventh day, okay, this is a, a drawing of it. And actually, at Pearl Harbor, they put me in this uh, on mess cooking since I was the last guy on board. And of all things, well, this is the best decks here where the crew came the, the uh, gallery was up here, so you, people would get their food, come down, and they'd come down these steps, and then they'd come back through here, and this is where they would have their food. Well, after they ate, then they would come back past sick bay to right here. This is a scullery, and there was a trash can there, and they dumped their food in that, and that's where Jim was put 
for the 17th day. Now I thought the bit of the scholar, they say this is I owe me Shabbat. Well, it was uh, much lower, so it really wasn't as bad as I thought about. But anyway, uh, what I would do, I'd wash the, uh, uh, the trays and everything, put them into the, the large machine, it would steam them and, and that sort of thing, and then stack them up, and I'd have to carry them back up one flight of steps. So I'd come out here, I'd come back over here, I'd lean against the bulkhead with these trays in my hand, I had to use both hands to carry them, and let the ship roll back to start, to, to port, and lay back like this, <laughs> then as it started back this way, I'd start my run up the steps. Well, I got, one time I was just about two steps from the top, whenever I was a little late in starting my run, I guess, because it started back this way, and I, I just threw, well, here we've got about 20 trays, steel trays coming down, a steel deck, or a steel ladder and a steel deck, and it, believe me, while well, the crew came running out there, they thought we'd been torpedoed, I guess. I don't, <laughs> Anyway, they helped me pick them up, and I put them up there like that. But anyway, that was, uh, okay. Well, anyway, 17 days later, we came in and here, and we saw Fujiyama. And we came around here and went into Tokyo Bay. Now, this is a typical street scene in Japan, 1951. Uh, it was far, far different than it is, is today. Because uh, it hadn't really been that long since the war was over. And uh, so a lot, you see a lot of these pedicabs here, uh, with the, uh, some of them would have the one wheel in the back and the people would ride in front. Uh, this guy is wearing uh, what are called geika. Those were wooden uh, shoes there with clogs that were about so high you'd see them like this. The lady over here is wearing more conventional ones with tommy and everything like that, wearing a komoda and everything like that. But this, this is a street scene that was pretty, pretty typical. Here's another one. This is an itinerant uh, Buddhist monk and uh, getting uh, a donation from a little girl there in front of this uh, grocery store there, uh, actually in, in Yokosuka, where we were. So we were there for about uh, uh, oh, a couple of weeks later, and we left Tokyo and Yokosuka, came out Sagami Bay, here's Fuji here, and we came down this way came up around the lower tip of Shikoku, through the inland sea of Japan, through Shimonoseki Straits, headed for Pusan. And so this was a several days trip too, because this LSP is good for about nine knots, about flank speed. And anyway, uh, oops, wrong button, sorry. So this was the view. We, we arrived there early in the morning, and we anchored in the outer breakwater. And so this was the first glimpse of the country that changed my life, as it did many people's for you know, all their lives, actually. So, uh, so we anchored here, and this is the breakwater here. And after a few minutes longer, well, we went, or I was there for about a couple hours, we went in. Now, these are all merchant ships that were in there with uh, supplies for the military. But see, this was back in the days before uh, containerization or anything like that, they all had to be unloaded by stevedores, by swinging cargo over the side and everything like that. It would take weeks sometimes to unload one of those ships. So most of these, have, some of these have been in here for a month, just waiting to be able to get dock space to get in, to be unloaded. After we got in further in, uh, several of these little boats came out there where they were bum boats and simply asking for anything that we wanted to give them. And this guy brought his little boy along, I guess, to give a little bit of a, uh, or you probably feel sorry for him or something like that. But anyway, uh, we call them bum boats, but they would take anything. Now the ship pulled into the dock, and so this is a good view looking back at the superstructure. So you can kind of see what, what this looks like. And uh, basically, uh, this upper part is the conning station up here, and this is where the officer uh, control the ship, where he he would uh, uh, tell the uh, helmsman which way to steer, and also give the commands for uh, the engine speed and that sort of thing. So this area right here is the wheelhouse, and that's where the helmsman would stand. You can see some portholes right here. We'll have an inside view of that in just a minute. And then 
these are uh, tank deck beds because when when the when the tank deck was loaded with all these tanks, they're running there was huge engines. Uh, more like this thing is filled with carbon monoxide and exhaust fumes and just the unreal. So we have these those vents are about four feet in diameter. We've got these huge fans in there to exhaust uh, the fumes from the tank deck. These are four davits. Those are uh, devices which hold the ship or hold the boats up like this. Here's another one that falls from a davit holding a, a boat. And this is an LCD piece suspended in the davit. That is a, one of the small boats. And uh, this is a cherry picker or a bobo crane that we we could travel around the deck to pick things up because we didn't have any other way of doing it. Uh, this is inside the wheelhouse, so the helmsman stood right here, and the lee helmsman stood right here. Now, directly above him, of course, was the officer that was in charge of the ship, and so there was, uh, when he wanted to change course, there was a steel tube about two inches in diameter with a funnel on each end. Uh, and he would say, you know, uh, uh, right standard rudder. Now I've got to admit that this uh, steel tube sounds like a pretty crude way of communicating, but I'll say one thing, that worked fine when the power was off, and, and which happened quite often like that. So this was a fail-safe way of communicating. And then if he said uh, all ahead full, that would come down and the Lee Helmsman would bring up that command on this to the engine room and, and that would happen. Now immediately back of this, of, of, of the helmsman here, was the chart room and actually where the radio, or the uh, radar room was, and then right in back of that was the radio room. So here you can see the bedding over the, where the uh, uh, helmsman was standing here, and this is the uh, chart room right here, and this is the radio room right here. And see in those days, uh, all of the communications were sent by Morse code. It was transmitted from Guam, so we had to have a radio operator here that was copying all these messages continuously. There was someone on there uh, uh, all the time, uh, and it would be sent. And if it happened to have our call sign on it, well, then of course they would copy the full message. That's Jim over there in back there, over there faking it, using a microphone. The USS Repose, which was a hospital ship, was in there, as was the Jutlandia. And which was a Danish uh, hospital ship. And uh, actually the repose was leaving at this time to go to Washington, uh, state of Washington, to have a helicopter landing pad put on it. Now what would happen would be like some of the MASH units would, uh, would treat guys in the field and then they might fly them to here to Pusan to go for a hospital ship or possibly uh, to uh, uh, to Japan. But, here, uh, they were in, uh, could be treated right here. Okay, now in Pusan those days, here's a street scene of Pusan, 1951. And here is another uh, Buddhist monk here. And I'm not sure this guy's wearing his uh, uh, comforter here, I guess. <laughs> uh, and the ladies are, carried things on their heads. That was a quite way. All the little babies were carried on the backs of, of the ladies. And, uh, and you notice right here, someone else with something on her head. And here we have uh, actually a, a very well-dressed lady here. And I'm not sure what this costume is, but I guess. Uh, this is another good, you see this lady is carrying this uh, bucket on her head completely. And, and uh, as this lady is here, uh, the, uh, these guys in the middle are wearing these A-frames. Now this is how so much was transported because you know they didn't have any gasoline or trucks or anything like this. They would carry this stuff on, on here. So this one is unloaded and this guy's got a, a fairly good load of material in here. Okay, now uh, we were there, only there for a couple of days. They let us, uh, or we went ashore in there and took those pictures. And then the next day we loaded up uh, and these are 600 North Korean and Chinese prisoners of war. And there was a prison, there was an island just south of there, several hours down the street, that was a prisoner of war island. It was called Kojido. And we spent some quite a bit of time down there and I have quite a few more pictures that we'll take there. So this was a, the first group of 
prisoners of war that we were taking down there. We took that, these couple of fire trucks, and some other supplies down there. This is a very good picture of the ship when it is uh, on the beach. You see here the doors are open. We open up the doors. Uh, they came in, they dropped the stern anchor back here, and th that had two purposes. One, with it back here, it kept the ship from swinging from side to side or broaching and that sort of thing, and also in retraction. You could pull it back whenever you were trying to back off the beach. At one time we came in when it was fairly high tide, and the tide went out, we were supposed to leave, and backing down, we pulled on the stern anchor and actually pulled it in, so they had to catch it back out with one of the small boats, Finally, we were pulling on that, backing down for all. They had an army guy with a bulldozer come over and push on the bottom doors to give us a shove to get us off the beach. Uh, these are POWs down here that are starting to unload the ship. We, uh, okay, this is looking into the, into the tank deck here. You can uh, see that. Uh, Uh, yeah, okay, now there was this road right in front, and a couple of friends of mine and I asked if we had permission to go up and walk around and look around the island. So, so they said, okay, you can go this way, but don't go down this way. You can't go down that way, because that's where the, the prisoner of war camp is. So, so we went up this way, and there was a little village on the other side. Well, here's another one of those guys with uh, one of those loaded A-frames. This was the little village there. There was a sign right at the foot of that. I couldn't find it. I was going to put that in there. It said, drive slowly. You may kill your replacement. <laughs> so, so, so. Anyway, so we then continued on up the hill. And this was the view looking to the north. So you can see all the paddings here and the farms and so forth. This is the road we were on. In fact, as we came up this road here, the LST is down here. We came walking up the road. The village was here. We came walking up here. Then later on, we're back over here, and about the next picture I have, I think, uh, was taken from here, looking back this way. But as we were going along there, going through the village and everything like that, uh, these two ladies were walking along. They're very well dressed, and you know she has her little baby on her back, and this lady is dressed in white. Now, there was also uh, this Korean gentleman here. He's wearing a, a very uh, a hat that is actually made from horsehair. It's woven horsehair. It's a ceremonial hat. And in thinking about this, I think very likely, since those two people were out there all dressed in white, that it's very likely it was a funeral because the white was there, uh, it was like black as far as we're concerned mm -hmm. like that. So it being so well dressed and everything, that it's very likely that that's what was happening there for the funeral. Okay, so this is where I said, I said we, the picture that we did, I did take uh, showed you before was taken over here. Then we walked up this road and we're looking back and here you can see the LST right here. So when we went back aboard the ship and I got up here on the, from the wheelhouse and I took this picture. Now this is the prisoner of war camp. There were 130,000 prisoners of war in there at that time. And there actually had been more. But there, this was five times more than the camp had been built for. So they ran, they ran the camp. Uh, the guards, they, they didn't even go in, into, the, into, the, into that area at all because they, were, they had these people stacked in there everywhere. Uh, this picture, uh, oh, I did not take this. This is the Coach Joe Prince Camp 52. So uh, the ship was right up this, up this way. And looking back in, this area here was uh, quite uh, notorious as uh, 76, 77, 78 because there were really two types of prisoners there. There were the hardcore North Korean communist types and the Chinese. So those were the very pro-communists. Then there were South Korean soldiers that had been impressed into the North Korean army and had been captured. And, and they were pro, uh, you know, the UN and US forces and everything. So there was a great deal of conflict between the two groups in here. There were kangaroo courts in there where they would, you know, execute one another and, and, and this sort of thing. So what was happening, they were trying to sort these people out by taking the hardcore, leaving the hardcore here 
and then moving the ones who were more with South Korean sympathies to the mainland where they would, you know, where they would, wouldn't be quite so isolated. So this uh, picture I got from the courtesy of Joe in the museum. Uh, this is May Day, and I think it's very likely it was May Day 1951, because here are the, the North Korean symbols, and they've got the ceremonial uh, things here, which is very possibly a grave, I don't know. But anyway, this was pretty much kind of what the camp looked like uh, going up there. I never was up there, so I don't know about that. So this is another picture taken from the LST. And here, uh, this is part of what we did for uh, several weeks, almost a month. They would bring up, marching up these groups of prisoners, probably around 100 or so per group. They would march them up here, and then we would have pulled the LST in to a berm and load them on board. And so here you notice that this is a prison-made uh, South Korean flag. I, I had one that... Uh, Hi. Hi. Well, they had one up on the pole outside. It's going outside. Okay. Well, it had been previous weeks. So I didn't know. Okay. okay. All right. Well, anyway, that was it. Now I have one. I think they put. put I made it for the, the exhibit in here. Uh, I got one from one of the prisoners. About so big. I gave him a pack of cigarettes for it. And uh, of course, the sea store cigarettes were seventy-five cents a carton. So that meant the pack of cigarettes was worth about like seven and a half cents, which the prices have gone up a little bit oh, yeah. recently. So anyway, so anyway, they're on board here, and actually we're just starting to back away from from that berm. And when when the ship came in, the ship was backed out enough, and, and the bow was over to the right. So when when we came in, uh, the officer who was commanding the ship would line up these two E's. If our our orders were to land on Easy Beach that he would come in, line up these two E's where they would be in line, so we, he would be square with the berm whenever he came in, and he would hit it. Now these guys are being loaded on an LST over on the other side of us. And uh, here, uh, this is, uh, the, it was loaded up, and uh, this is, uh, we took, now this is back on the mainland now, uh, to a place called Urasan. So we came up here, and they are coming, they're going down, the ones on the deck, uh, are coming down both of these two uh, doorways here, down and going out the bow doors. There were also the tank that was loaded with them, and so you can see them over here on, on, the, on the beach. So they were being loaded into, uh, on this train to be taken to the prisoner of war camp. Now it wasn't very far away, uh, so uh, here they're going aboard. So. It wasn't too important to have a window seat, I guess. <laughs> they were loaded load by here. So generally, then, what would happen after uh, we have bring a load of prisoners into uh, the mainland? Uh, well, this is a, another port. This was a Mason, where we had brought up another load. And you notice here, here's another one of those South Korean flags. So here, uh, we unloaded them here, and they were carried, transported off to the prison war camp in trucks there. But after we made a trip up here, we would go back to Pusan. And so we're picking up a load, uh, load of the bad guys to take down to Kojido. So these are trucks for the coach. So the procedure would be that they, they came up here and stopped. Uh, the truck would stop and unload. They would get off the truck uh, and assemble here. So this is actually about like the fourth group here. And after the, the group had assembled here, then they would march, come up through, and they would come in through the bow doors of the LST. And they'd come up the ramp and be on the, uh, uh, on the deck here. Now, there was eight, we had 1,800 of these guys on board at that time. Probably had about 10 guards for all that whole thing, but you know, uh, they weren't going anywhere, so that. But anyway, so this is still in Pusan, so then we would take them back to, to the, uh, uh, to, to Kojido and unload them there. Now, normally we took off right off very soon, but we pulled in there. These guys were loaded up, and we were on there for, they were on there for about like an hour, and I, I wonder what in the world were we waiting for? Well, 
even the, the POWs were getting impatient because they started singing and chants and this sort of thing. And so checking around, what had happened was the weather had changed. It, it really was starting to blow a little bit. And our captain was a little leery about taking this load of people out of the open sea with all on this deck up here. But after hearing this chanting and singing for about 30 minutes, he said, well, uh, cast off. So we, we cast off and they were singing and everything. It was probably the first ocean voyage. And we got clear to breakwater and got out there and that LSD started going through its motion. It got very quiet on there. And uh, so for the rest of the trip into Cochino for about like three hours. Now, they were very happy, I think, to, to, to get put in the camp down there. So we, we did this duty for about, uh, uh, about a month. Uh, we'd be over there for about a month. And then after a month of whatever we were doing over there, we would go back to Japan. And usually it was on the southern island of Kyushu. And so this is the harbor in Sasebo, Japan. This was one of our sister ships. This is another LST, the 692. And uh, so we would be in here for, to refuel, resupply, repairs, and everything like that. And we would be there for uh, about a month. And uh, how are we doing time, Joe? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Okay, if anybody's got to catch a bus, let me know. Okay, so then, uh, what happened, oops. Okay, this, this is a street scene. This is known as Black Market Street there in Sassabo. And then I took it up here. Here, this is rush hour traffic control in Sassabo. Uh, they got uh, There were these, these are three-wheel motorcycle type vehicles that were used. Uh, a little truck in the a bed in the back they used for transporting things like that. They didn't have any, really many large vehicles at all. And uh, so it wasn't until later. But anyway, this is uh, what it was there. So on the uh, February the 25th, here's Sasebo down here. Uh, Pusan was up here where we were before. Here's Kojido here. So we were right in this area before. This time, however, we left Sasebo. We went over to this point and went directly, I was due north to this area which was called Area Nan. It was up in the Heiju Bay region. And uh, we arrived up there, well, here again, February the 27th, uh, 7.20 p.m. Uh, this is that Heiju Bay area right in here. And, and Inchon is down here. Now, our goal and where we went was this island right here, Taeyong Pyong Do. Uh, this island is the one that has been in the news off and on during the last two or three years where the North Koreans have uh, fired artillery into it and actually killed somebody over there. This is the North Korean mainland here and with their artillery they could fire into that island. Uh, and this is about the only island that is under, that belongs to South Korea today. So the line actually comes up around this island. And that, it's a real sore point for the North Koreans that that island is belongs to South Korea. So and that's one reason why they've been pretty aggressive about that. Now, uh, here is a sister ship, the 692. And what we were doing, we, we came up to relieve the 692. They had been up there for a month. So we came up to relieve her. She will go back to Sasebo and go through all the rehabilitation and loading up supplies and everything like that. And we were going to stay there and assume the duties there. They, uh, there were about six, there were six LSTs in a division, and the commander of the division was the lieutenant commander, and uh, of course he being the uh, commander, he could choose whichever ship he wished to be on. Well, he was a real uh, gung-ho type of a guy, and so he wanted to be where the action was, and so even though he'd been up here on the 692 for a month, he transferred the 692 over to our ship to be there while the 692 went back. And uh, he had been going on uh, taking some of the, the small boats out uh, on, on raiding parties and this sort of thing, uh, which 
was uh, not exactly looked upon with real favor. Uh, anyway, this is the island of Teyopyongo, the western part of that. And uh, here we pulled into this west beach. So the ship came in and landed here on the uh, beach in the west beach. To kind of give you a perspective here, of course, these are people standing here. So you know, see, it's, it's a very reasonably sized ship. And uh, so we, we beached here. Now, the, the, this is the Yellow Sea. Actually, this is where the ship is down here. And this is North Korea over here. And uh, one of the islands that's right in here. So we, we were right in here. Uh, where the picture was. Now, the, the Yellow Sea has about the second highest tidal range of any place in the world. The Bay of Fundy is, is the greatest, but a uh, tidal range here of 30 feet is, is not anything at all unusual. So we are, this tide is starting to go out and we're here. The code name for, for this island was Apple Pie. So uh, we're high and dry in Apple Pie here. All the other islands down there had the code name. Rather than go through all the Korean names for them like that, they all had names. All, they were all drinks. Zombie, Gimlet, Martini, and everything else for, for the drinks. So, so uh, the ship was here. And as the tide continued to go out, the ship was truly high and dry. It is sitting right on the bottom of this. Here are one of the davits hanging out here. This rail along the side is, is a, uh, yeah, I was known as a, a pontoon rail, and they, at times we would have large pontoons that would be brought in and lifted up by a crane and tied to the side, and then we'd, we could cut them loose and build a causeway into the shore. So this is, uh, looking at the, uh, at the bottom of the ship, so you can see how much water that it actually drew. Uh, here is the stern. So here is the, these were twin mount, twin 40 millimeter guns here, a single 40 millimeter gun here, and uh, this is a 20 millimeter gun up here. Uh, this was the fire control tower, and of course the conning station was up here. And uh, then, oh, uh, there's old Jim sitting on one of the screws of the ship here. So you see here's the depth. This is six feet from, from there. Now, uh, up on the hill, we walked up there, and there were uh, ROK, South Korean soldiers, that were living in these trenches up here. And so we went there and talked to them a little bit. One of the guys I was with went back to the ship and brought about 10 pounds of rice up to them like that. And you'd think they'd won the war whenever they gave them to that. Really, it was, they were extremely grateful. A, uh, later, and then later uh, on this island, uh, uh, this is one of the, I, I walked over to, uh, uh, one of the, uh, uh, over to, across the island there, and took up this picture here. This is one of the, uh, uh, these are not rags on here. They're actually squid. They were, they were drawing squid there. And uh, then this was the village well. And uh, so they were doing that down here. And this was in the uh, fishing village. This is the fishing village right here. As I said, they they're, they're, they fish for squid. That's what these nets are that are hanging in the fishing boats that are, are up here. Uh, what would we would do uh, uh, at night? We had a night station. We would go around on the north side of the island and anchor there at night. And the idea was to keep the North Koreans from coming in and taking the island. But the fishermen were allowed to go out if they were, they were supposed to go out and anchor and fish at that spot and not move. Uh, well, you know how fishermen are. They aren't biting here, let's move over here. And as soon as they did that, then the guy on the radar said, you know, their boat is moving and such and such and such. And so at first we'd send boats out to help them come back and later they said that's too much work. We'll just fire a shot right through the sails. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, and of course, that caused a little bit of excitement too, like that one. But that was supposed to be the idea. So that was for, what, what these were for. And they, were, they weren't going to hurt anybody, but they just wanted to let them know that they knew that they were moving. Now, to kind of refresh your memory a little bit, or maybe you weren't too sure about it, 
Uh, I put this map in. This is from uh, a book of the coldest winter. That before June of 1950, the 38th parallel, of course, was the dividing line with South Korea being here and North Korea being up here. Then in June, when the North Koreans invaded and came down through here uh, with very little resistance, they came down. And on, by September the 15th, this little line right here, right around Pusong, this was the only area that was controlled by the southern South Korea or, or the United Nations forces. This was known as the Pusong River. On September the 15th, MacArthur uh, pulled his coup and landed at Incheon. Well, when he landed at Incheon, the troops went ashore there and started the drive inland like that. Well, here again, if they had gone further, gone off, they could have cut off. And because by well, that time also they had broken through, the 8th Army had broken through the Pusan perimeter and they were driving north. So here was September 15th. By September 26th, they were already right up here. And so here again, that's where all those guys at the prison camp in Gojido came from whenever they, uh, they were captured in here. So they continued on, and uh, at uh, on October, uh, uh, let me think, when was that? Oh, I guess I didn't write it down here. Anyway, uh, I had the timelines when, when they were here. Uh, in, I guess it was October, well, it was the first part of October, the North Koreans crossed the line going north, and one week later, why the U.S. crossed the line. Now Mao sent uh, a message of warning, or tried to, through the Indian embassy that that they, they were not, to, if they were going to cross the 38th parallel going north, that China would get into the would get into the war. Well, that message really never got through, or, or MacArthur. Did, he did not choose to uh, believe in that. I don't know how much of a fan of MacArthur you are, but uh, I'm not too strong for him. Anyway, they kept going north, and it was just a race back in October 15th here, October 26th. And as the forces were moving forth here, they would come into a village and find the, the people who, uh, many, many times, that whoever had been in charge of the village like that, had been killed because they were they were the communists like this, and so uh, they had already taken over. So they kept on going. October the 26th, they got to the Yalu, and uh, at Unsan. Uh, in, in the meantime, the Chinese, had, their division upon division, had crossed the Yalu and were all in North Korea, and the first contact was here at Unsan. And uh, so then when everything uh, broke free and they crossed over and started down, well, they, they started coming back down just about as fast as they went up. But one of the net results of this whole thing was that as they came down, these people who had uh, done in the, the, the village leaders were now going to be confronted with the, the communists coming back in here and they're back in and they've slain the, the leaders. So they were ahead. They were now becoming real refugees to get out of there. And this particular province right in here was very susceptible to that. But the net effect was that they came down here and there were thousands of them that were trapped in this, in this part of the peninsula, right, right in here. So uh, when that happened, uh, oops, wrong way, I went too far. Okay, this is this area right here. So many of them, thousands of them, went over to this island of Pyongyang Do here, and also to, here's, uh, well this stuff is a different spelling, but this is the one that I've been talking about, Pyongyang Do here. And so uh, there were about three LSTs made several runs, taking thousands of these refugees back to Incheon, down to South Korea, to get them out of there. But still, there were still many, many uh, 
refugees and people with South Korean sympathies all scattered throughout these islands. As you can see, the whole area is just a mass of islands. Some of them are underwater at, at uh, high tide. Others are, you know, a thousand, over a thousand feet tall. And so uh, the U.S. Army Special Forces organized a lot of these people into uh, guerrilla units. And at this particular time, they were called wolf packs. And I'll tell you, up y'all go was wolf pack five. Wolf pack five. And there was a hundred. They had, I think, 139 uh, members in wolf pack five. This was one of a guerrilla junk from wolf pack five. They had a. Uh, when I took the picture, I went by it on the boat and looked back this way. I didn't get a picture of it. They had a real ancient machine gun up there. But anyway, this was part. Now, they would go in at night or make raids on the island, uh, you know, and, uh, for, you know, for various things, anything they could do to, to disrupt things, uh, you know, wreck bridges or, or, or kill people or whatever like that. But the uh, U.S. Army Special Forces controlled that, so this was World Pack 5. Now, we on the ship uh, were kind of in support of that. Now, this is a... This stands for Landing Craft Vehicle Personnel. It's about 35 feet long. It will hold a jeep or about 20-something uh, troops. And normally we didn't have this, but there are two gun welts back here. There's, two, and there's a 30 caliber machine gun here. It's driven, uh, steered by the coxswain here. This is the engine engineer who handles the stern line. And then this is the bow hook who handles the lines forward when necessary. Uh, this was an SCR 610 radio set, which uh, I, I put on there, uh, put them all there, so they would have, we'd have communication. So, in, in the plans for the area, these boats were, came out to be called Swanee boats. And, and this one is, this is number three, so uh, the call sign for that we would call it would be Swanee 3. So we'd say, you know, like Swanee 3, Swanee 3, this was built in 561 coming in over like this if we talk with them. And so we had three boats like this. Then we had a, a fourth boat was this. Now this was an LCPL. This is a landing craft patrol large. It's built slightly different. It doesn't have a ramp in front. And the gun wells were up forward. Those are the 230 caliber machine guns here. And so this boat was used by uh, the lieutenant commander in his investigations and raids. So since he was in charge, he was the leader, hence this is where the name Swanee Leader came from. So, uh, we went. now, on March the 3rd, we were, this is the island of Teyongyongyo. Now, where I showed you we were beached before is right here. The fishing village is down on this, right in this area here. So I walked over this island, took the pictures here, and we were down here. And this is the beach. So during the day, we would be anchored here. At night, we would move up here and uh, try to keep control, to keep people coming in from the mainland, get, getting on the island, and that sort of thing. And this is where all the fishermen were. On March the 3rd, uh, in the morning, uh, actually it's before, right after I had breakfast, about like 7 o'clock, they lowered down LCPL in the water with 11 guys. Well, the commander, this lieutenant commander I told you about, the executive officer of the ship, uh, there was a South Korean naval lieutenant that was on there that they used as an interpreter. And we had two British Marines on board that was attached that came over with, with uh, Calm LSD uh, Div 12. Anyway, those 11 guys got on this boat. And uh, the wind was coming from the northwest. The wind was coming down this way, so the seas were coming down like this. And believe me, you, know, you guys from Korea know it was cold. And, uh, but they were traveling with the sea, so it wasn't too bad. Now they came on down here. This, here's the scale. See, this is about one mile here. So see, this is a distance of, you know, four or five miles down here. So you could just barely get good eyes and see the boat down, especially because the seas were pretty rough and, and they were really scared. So they came on down. And their goal was this FS-351. This was a ship that was anchored there. Here, is, here it is. It was a freight supply ship that had built for the Army in World War II and had been uh, run by uh, Coast Guard crews. But 
And of course, I did not know this at the time, but now it was run by the CIA. The CIA were all over the place, and I didn't know that until I you know, did all the research and everything on the ship. But they were all over the place. So this was a CIA uh, ship. And the operation on that was also a naval person. He was a lieutenant commander also. Anyway, what they did, they, uh, oops, they came in here and he got aboard there. And they went on up this way. They were going on this investigation. Well, when they got up here near Mirongido, they were now going into the, into the wind, into the sea. Well, the poor coxswain is standing up there exposed. Everybody else can get down, get their head down. So, but he's got this spray and everything coming on like that with wind coming. Well, anyway, the result was that he got just an extreme chill. I mean, he couldn't even stand up. So he was, he was just practically there. So when they got up here, so they turned the boat around and uh, I'm not sure who was actually steering it then. It's very possible that Sig was steering it or there was another uh, guy that was learning to be a coxswain, but yet he, wasn't, he hadn't had much experience. So they came on back down to the FS-351 and unloaded the guy with the chill. And actually they radioed back to the 561. I happened to have the radio duty that morning, so I talked with them. And they said that they told told about the guy getting the chill that they had come back. So uh, I relayed the message to the captain and everything like that. And so they decided to send a doctor on one of the LCVPs down to take care of that. So they left here and came on down. Now just as they got to the uh, five six to the three five one, the other ship was radioed back that they were returning to the LST. Well. They came back here, and you know, half an hour went by, which is about as long as it's supposed to take. And then nearly an hour went by, and they still didn't show up. And till then, we did see a boat. Well, what it was, it was the boat that had taken the doctor down, and came back. Well, they, they didn't show up. Well, we, uh, we didn't have the call, the radio frequencies for this ship, but we did have uh, one for this Charlie Fox up here. Now, this was another CIA operation up here, but this was the U.S. Air Force that was up there. So we ran over to him, and he could see the ship from there. He said the, the, it's, it, it's tied up alongside. And then, and we called him again later, and he said, well, he was so excited. He said, I'm going up in my helicopter pretty soon. I'll take a look. Well, in the meantime, the, uh, the man who was really in, had been in charge of all the ships there uh, was actually on this Canadian destroyer. They had left for the day for refueling. Well, they came back, and he got all this great news of what had happened while he was gone. So they went around the island this way, looking for stuff. So this is late afternoon. So the FS-351 got underway, and they came down here, and they started finding some debris in the water. So we got underway and came down there, and we found uh, there's a couple of uh, an oil can, a fuel can, uh, an engine cover from that. Uh, a, a couple of watch caps. One of the watch caps belonged to one of my fellow shipmates, and also uh, a foul weather uh, jacket that was being worn by one of the British Marines. And it was also a British Marines hat that was in there. So uh, uh, we picked up the they picked up the debris, and it was it was getting dark. So we were ordered to go back and go to our night station. So we came back up to our night station here. Well, you know, it was really weird that night. Here, that morning, all these people were on board. That evening, they were just gone. You know, they just weren't there anymore. So it was really, it was really kind of strange. And the, uh, well, what happened is in the days of whaling ships, the uh, MAA came down and cut the locks off of the guys that, uh, you know, my shipmates, and, uh, uh, they took out the things to send it there next to Ken, and then just as happened for a hundred years or so, their clothing was auctioned off to uh, the other crew to uh, uh, to anybody go into the ship's run. Uh, it was a little bit too much for me. I went to the radio shack to get away from that. But anyway, uh, so we went back there and. Uh,
Uh, this was not the only thing that uh, uh, this, okay, this is uh, of this area here. This was this, I'll be back up a little bit. Okay, see this, this is Tango here. This is that kind of a long st uh, stretch of land here with an island on the end. And then this is an island here, Moido. Okay, here's this long stretch of land with that island. And this is Moido over here. The fishing village is on this side over here. Okay, at this island, now the, the debris that we found was just right in here, right in here. This island was Soyongyongdo, or its code name was Zombie. Right. Anyway, so this is in the, oops, uh, this is the log from the ships, which gives the, uh, you know, other ways before anchored. Uh, it gave all the names of the people who were lost. It says, uh, you know, the Royal Marines and cause of small boat loss on Melbourne. But uh, it, it basically was because the seas were so high, you've got an inexperienced coxswain on there, and the boat simply swung, swung lost. And the water temperature was such that you could, uh, you know, hypothermia would set in, you probably, would, 10 minutes would be absolutely the maximum you could possibly you could live. It's really interesting because uh, Hamill, uh, we found that, that fell with a jacket that he was wearing. Well, to show his, you know, in his struggle for survival, he took his jacket off because it's impeded in swimming. And, and that, was, that was one of the things that we found. Okay, now, the, the two British Marines were from the Belfast, and this is a salvo that was being fired by the Belfast. It's, you know, 20 miles away into Korea like that. So here they're throwing several hundred pounds of high explosive 20 miles in there for, for like that. And then after they had finished firing, this was the, the destroyer of the Athabasca where the commander of the area was. So they came by here. So this is the Belfast. Now the Belfast today is the Naval Museum, floating Naval Museum on the Thames in London. And uh, the two British Marines that were on board a ship that were lost were from this, from this ship. And uh, I guess it was about like two Decembers ago, I got uh, an email, I have a website for my book, and I got an email from London, from, from England, stating that they had ordered a book and wanted to know if it had been dispatched. And it had, it was kind of a mix up somehow, but anyway, I sent the guy back an email, I said, I'm sending your book now, paying the postage for it. I said, I couldn't help but notice that your name was the same as the surname as one of the British Marines that was lost aboard my ship in Korea. And it was the guy's grandson. So his father, who was probably only just uh, a few years old when his father was killed here, uh, was it now with this guy's grandfather. Anyway, the book arrived in London on Christmas Eve, and on Christmas Day in Wales, this man read how his father died almost 60 years before. So anyway, and he had never found him. He had a bit for the internet. That's how, how hard he located the thing. We also acted as a sort of a, a mothership for other ships. This is a wooden hole, wooden hole mine sweeper. Of course, the wooden hulls would keep the magnetic mines from, from exploding. And uh, what had happened on this ship, one of the crewmen had a, an ulcer that had perforated or something like that. He was really sick. So they brought him over here. And of course, they, they radioed in, put him into those wire basket stretchers, and we hauled him up on board. And uh, then, they, they, of course, they made contact, and this had all been set up. So then. Uh, this was a, a, one of the officers, Sherwood Hopes. He was actually Palo Alto. But anyway, uh, then the rescue copter came in, picked the guy up and take him back in, John, or to a hospital uh, somewhere over there to, to take care of him. So the LST was really a great platform for, for, for helicopters and like that. It's just, you know, just a great size for that sort of thing. Here are two, two other mine sweepers. And since they were so small, they couldn't generate their own fresh water. So they came in and we were giving them fresh water and also diesel for the engines and that sort of thing and supplies. So they, they were in there. Now they're they strictly USN uh, type ships 
and were uh, you know, Sweden for mines in the area. But they, well, he also act, helped and fueled these. These are two World War II uh, torpedo boats, uh, the 26 and the 23. Now, they took the tubes off of them, the torpedo tubes off, and equipped them with five-inch rockets. So these are all tubes for five-inch rocket launchers. And they had been on a raid uh, on the mainland the night before, so these are all tubes for the expended rockets are in here. Interestingly enough, guess who controls these boats? CIA. They were CIA boats, but were run by South Korean naval uh, sailors. And so they, they were right here. Now, they had the same kind of radar that we had on their ship. And the, one of them, I don't remember which one it was now, there, it wasn't working. So when I heard that, I said, hey, maybe I can fix it. Because what I was hoping, I might be able to get a ride on one of these things. <laughs> and it worked. I got on that thing. That was the darndest boat ride I've ever been on in my life. I mean, those three Packard Marine engines just kept going higher. That bow just kept going up and up and up and that fish tail in the back going on. And especially for me on that LST and cruising along at a ripping nine knots or something like that. It was really pretty thrilling. Uh, anyway, so here's, this is another same, same with this. So, so we serviced them to, um, and, and we also refueled and so forth. Okay, 4th of July, 1952, we were in Incheon. And uh, this was a replacement for the boat that was lost right here. That's an LCVP, uh, PL, and this is a replacement. Now this, is, of course, is a dress ship for us. And so we were in Incheon on July of 52. Now, of course, this is a couple of years after the invasion. Uh, it looks like an armor-piercing shell went through that tank there without blowing the whole thing up. There are other naval ships here. You can see the dress ships in here like this. And this is, uh, this is actually south. This is the city of Inchon over here, almost left of it. And uh, what I did, uh, okay, here, this is uh, 52. So this is another sister LST in here. And they were loading uh, Marines and everything on here. This area in here was known as Blue Beach during the landing. And, and Red Beach was on the other side. This, uh, there was an island in here called Wolby Doe. And that was the first one, the Marines first went in and took Wolby Doe. And then we went to the other islands. Now, I did not take, this is a picture I took, this is Naval Archives. The other previous picture I took, we were on the other side. This is Wolby Doe here. Here's our old 715 again that we talked about earlier. She is in here for the invasion. And so there are three LSTs in here that are showing. So this kind of gives you an idea of what it looked like in real time. Uh, like this. It looked like a, some kind of a, a bomb or a shell went through the roof of this. And uh, these are all stuff. They're just uh, uh, discharging. This is a couple of days. I think about, oh, only about one or two days after, after, the, after, the, uh, after the landing. Now, uh, if some of you, if you did serve and went into Inchon any time, because it's so shallow there, any troop type ship can't get in there. LSD comes in and we're like we would say high and dry at night when the tide went out. So most of it was done by a shuttle. This is an LC, it's a landing craft utility, 864. So there's a, uh, a ship carrying the, the, the troops offshore. So they load up with the troops, bring them in here. These guys are coming off here and coming up this ramp. And the guys that are coming from the front or off the lines that are going back uh, to, to Japan or the States or something like that are lined up here and are going to go back on board and they're going back out and get loaded up. I was one of the guys coming in that way. Pardon? I was one of the guys were you in that way. way. Let's look here. Now go back to your previous scene. Because we got off our ship out there in the water onto yeah. a, a manned LST of um, their whole maybe, oh, what probably whole two, three hundred of us stat, standing like vertical far oh, in okay. the okay. end of that thing. And he ran right up on that beach. Well, that, that yeah, it was probably one of these then. It was probably one of these. Yeah, probably so. It wasn't, that looks even bigger, but. We came in on that beach. It's on that previous picture. Oh, really? Okay, on that beach? He, he just jumped there, dropped it down, and we assaulted the beach. 
up to the train tracks that you saw. Yeah, the train tracks. Right. Exactly. 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 And took exactly. us into the replacement depot at Young Young Hall. Okay. But Why were there? <laughs> yeah, there this is the hull of a ferry boat. That, that thing you got sunk and capsized and went over. That's just the hull sticking up over here. Now, this looks like they had some kind of a ramp system. And, and we did yeah, it just a ramp was in here. And of course, the tide went out uh, we that night, and that's just all mud. Yeah. It's mud out there. Yeah, oh, yeah. Wild. Well, that, that previous picture with, with your uh, LSTs there, that one, it's just like our little LST came up to that beach, right dropped the there. ramp down, yep, yep. there was an MP or two. Yeah, somewhere there. right in here, sure, I'm sure And there's, you see the railroad tracks right here. Okay. We got up there and got on the train, but this was 19... Well, we look good though, we might fight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, boy. Okay, this is the, now, here again, you never get tired of uh, practice and everything like this. This is the Logan, is it? Uh, it's uh, an attack transport, uh, AK-196, and it carried about, like, uh, so we went on maneuvers. What are you going to do when you're up there in your third time? You go on maneuvers. You never get enough training. And uh, so it carried about like 12 of these uh, 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 LCMs. They were larger than the ones that were on our ship. And uh, so we went on maneuvers up there. and. Uh, the way it would work, and this is World War II type of warfare, this doesn't exist anymore. But anyway, they, they would put all their troops, they would carry uh, 1,500 troops or something like that, put them in the small boats like this. They would be out there searching for a while, then the beach master would say, go in. So a wave of them would go in. So these are LCMs going in. I don't think they had troops in them, but they were just, at least they are running the boats in. <coughs> We carried, when we went up this time, a different type of a vehicle. These are a landing vehicle track. These are LVTs. So they don't have a, uh, the, you can tell by this very distinctive pattern of the waves that they're a track vehicle. But we went up uh, and they're, they, these are all Marines that are in, in here. And uh, there are more LVTs. Now, this, these are LVTAs, uh, armor. They had a can on them. Those others that I had were just carrying the troops or supplies or something like that. But these actually had a very short barrel can on them. So these guys came off our ship. We dropped them off out there. And so they're waiting, they're waiting deployment, circling around here, and then they'll get the radio call to go in, so then they'll go into the beach like so. And uh, so they're coming back to the ship. I climbed up the mast on our ship to take this picture. Uh, to, so we so get a, a good vantage point up there to see them coming back in here. And then this is one of them coming in, being back loaded. It's coming in right to the, from the bow, where the bow, so the bow doors are open, the ramp is down, and they can just come right back up. We can put the ramp down because that's above the water line. And so we're not, it's not going to cause any problems there. So this is this little cannon that they have there, not much of a barrel line, but these are all Marines. I forget which, which outfit this, this is. Anyway, we had pretty much done our time over there. We've been over there almost a year. So it was time to come back. And here's the old 715 again. Uh, and so we're on our way back to Hawaii. So what this is, uh, we're going to exchange movies with them. Because you know, you draw movies at, at the store in the Cusco or something like that. And then uh, after you'd seen the same one a couple of times, why well, you'd exchange them. So you'd give them all your worst movies, and they would give you their worst movies, and and uh, we do that. So anyway, we come alongside. Now you have to be careful. They put the best helmsman on here because uh, uh, well, there's a law in physics. You get two bodies like together like this with the fluid flowing between them. It will pull them together. So you've got to be a little care careful about that. So they have the best helmsman uh, on there doing that, and uh, a line throwing gun would shoot a line over. They would pull this over and rig this, and then uh, uh, these, here's the crew over here. If the ship started moving close together, and the thing started sagging to the water, you know, when the guy here, you, they would haul in on it to get, you know, so it wouldn't go into the water. And so here's the, here's the movies for the day. And we're in Hawaii, and it was Aloha greeting here, and then uh, in the San Diego, with a well done and so forth. And we were down in San Diego for, uh, or in Southern California for a couple of 
uh, for about two months, I guess. And then we came north, and guess what? That's the way it was. Now, when you see Coit Tower over here, above everything else, you know that was a long, <laughs> long time ago. Anyway, that's what I did on my summer vacation. Thank you.